Dr. Garrett Ward Sheldon is a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia and an ordained Christian minister. He has been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, Moscow University, the University of Vienna, Austria, and Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. Dr. Sheldon has written 10 books on political philosophy, religion, law, and history, as well as the Christian novel, What Would Jesus Do? Dr. Sheldon has been a past advisor to the White House and delegate to the APAC Policy Conference, which stands for American Israel Public Affairs Committee in Washington, D.C. In this episode of Triumph Talks, we will be discussing his memoir, My Life Loves and Laughs, which has been published and reviewed around the world. Dr. Sheldon, welcome to Triumph Talks, and thank you so much for spending some time with me. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I have enjoyed reading your book, which as you see, I have on my shelf, and I have a lot of the excerpts and the stories and the lessons that you share that I want to talk about today. You mean this book here? Yeah, I'm glad to see you have a copy. I'm sure you need it for reference. I have a copy if you... (laughs) Tell me what page to look at. I've got a copy. I will do that. I will do that. <laughs> what you haven't have memorized? <laughs> no, and I've you know, I've only I've only reread it two hundred thousand times. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I've actually never asked any of my authors. Now that your book is published, have you ever reread it? And I was mm-hmm. like, Sometimes we publish a book or we write a book and we're like, I am done. I, or I know in my case, I reread the books I published and I'm like, ah, I wish I'd have written that differently. I wish I'd have changed that sentence. And I just find myself wanting to edit it. So I just have to not, but it's a wonderful book and really some great content. I'm really looking forward to, I have a feeling this is going to be one of my longer shows just because there's so much that I want to talk to you about. So but we'll jump right in. I want to begin by asking you the first question, which is what inspired you to write this book? Well, I've always been interested in biographies and autobiographies. Mm. Um, and so I'd felt for a long time <clears throat> when I retired as a professor, I should write my memoir because I've had some very interesting experiences I've had tragedies, I've had blessings, joys, and so I wanted to share those, and especially as you see on the back cover, my faith and my um, corny sense of humor. (laughs) My students often said, if I ever quit being a professor, I could be a stand-up comedian. um, That is the best kind of professor. You you (laughs) you kept them awake. Yeah. Give them an abs workout sometimes, you know? Yeah. Heavy, (laughs) heavy topics. You got to lighten it up with a few corny jokes. And uh, my students (laughs) said, if you ever stop being a professor, you can be a stand-up comedian. Uh, My children always say, you know, if I need a one-liner, I call dad. Uh, Oh, (laughs) And I think that's uh, that's probably the Irish in me on my mother's side. That's a compliment. Honestly, yeah. because a lot mm-hmm. of times our kids don't think we're funny, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my daughter once, and she was in school, maybe, I don't know, fourth grade or something, when you could talk about uh, families and, and um, they had a discussion about mothers and fathers. And I, I asked her, well, what, what did you say? And Gwen said, I told them that daddies are for fun. And mommies are for responsibility. <laughs> and that about that about summarizes my family. Your your role in the family. Yeah. Yes. You're the fun one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yes, you have had a fascinating life. And I'm glad that you wrote a memoir so that we can all benefit from what you've experienced. Um, so let me just ask you the next question so we can jump right into to some of the content of your book. And that is, um, what do you hope people will take from reading your book? Well, again, as, um, as I say, as is on the back cover, I hope most of all, as a Christian academic, to leave my faith God's blessings and a smile, humor, a lightness in this sad world 
Um, there's so much tragedy. There's so much sadness that it'll yeah. be successful if I bring a knowledge of faith and a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> cheer them up you know people it's so sad you know the great king solomon the wisest king of israel said in proverbs laughter is a medicine laughter is a medicine a gift from god to cheer us up in this sad world yeah well and when we have hope we can feel more positive than those who are without hope and right so and when you have faith um, mm -hmm. uh, it was partly modeled on the great Christian autobiography, St. Augustine's Confessions. Mm -hmm. And he describes his faith and the effect of it. And uh, boy, he went through some things too. At the end of the Roman Empire, he lived as a rich young man. <laughs> wow. At the end of the Roman Empire, he knew about wow. sin. Um, but Kind of like our country seems to be going like our period, in Yes. Yeah. Wine so you really, fall. you and him really do have yeah. some <laughs> similarities. I can relate to him in the decline and fall of civilization. Yeah. Um, and that's been added one of your, your focuses. Is, is in the worst times, you ha you hold on to God and his blessings, his yeah. truth. I told someone, I, I retired from the church ministry about four months ago. So mm -hmm. now I'm completely retired. And one of the things I've noticed is that I recite over in my mind, probably 20 times a day, the Lord's Prayer, mm. the Our Father Prayer, which is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And it's all summarized in there, uh, God's power, God's goodness, and just asking him for his will in our lives and also for what we need. He says, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. And... Uh, that's again what King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> well, there's there's the pray for it, and then there's the read about it. <laughs> you know, right, right. And that's where memoirs are so important because they become the testimonials that show that prayer works. And um, well, and I think it. about this often, uh, Melanie. As I, as I reread this, I feel so privileged to have been able to write an honest. Mm. open story of my life. There aren't many countries where you could do that. Yeah, there aren't many that. periods. There aren't many places in this country because of your job or your position mm -hmm. or politics, pressure, where you could write a completely honest, open autobiography. Yeah. Yeah, definitely something to celebrate and do. So with that, if you don't mind, I'm going to grab your book. Good. And um, we're going to go, we're going to take a little tour <laughs> through it. <laughs> as I as I love to read books, I always read a book before I interview the author. And yours is full of dog ears, <laughs> which is what I do so I can find where I want to be. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is just, we're going to go through the book. I'm going to read some excerpts from all different parts. And then after I read it, if you would like to expand a little more on the subject matter or the experience that I'm highlighting, I think that would be really okay. interesting. So. so we're going to begin in childhood. Um, this just comes from the childhood chapter. My favorite Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, described a childhood home almost as dysfunctional as my own. There is comfort in knowing that others, especially those we admire, have experienced some of the suffering we have suffered. Like my parents, Lewis's mother was a kind, gentle, intelligent Christian woman who died young. His father, like mine, was emotionally unstable, filled with anger and hatred, and emotionally abusive. I suppose today my father would be called a narcissistic personality, totally absorbed with himself, selfish and demanding all the attention and praise, the most self-centered person I've ever known. And wow, that, that opening to your life, I love that you're able to draw a comparison to C.S. Lewis. I love C.S. Lewis and all that he's taught. And I'm certain that a lot of wisdom starts from having such a rough childhood. I also know a lot about narcissist personality disorder. I've, I've ghostwritten a 330-page book on it. So 
I have an idea of what you might have been through, but I wonder if you'd like to expand a little more on that. It could be talking about your mother because that was a tragedy or just anything else you'd like to say about this excerpt. Yeah, you know, I grew up, as I described, in the Midwest, Wisconsin, in the 1950s, uh, middle-class American Puritan ancestry, and we didn't talk about our problems. You weren't supposed to talk about your problems, especially the skeletons in your family closet. So originally, I wasn't going to talk about my troubled childhood, but then I read many autobiographies before writing this, and C.S. Lewis, my favorite Christian writer, describes growing up in a family as tragic as my own. A narcissistic father, a pathological, I mean, totally self-centered, totally, um, everything had to be about him. Um, sometimes they say a sociopath. He couldn't relate to anyone. He hated and envied everyone, including his own children, and mean to everybody, uh, and drove my dear sweet mother, who was a gentle, innocent Christian woman, drove her, his emotional abuse drove her to alcoholism and suicide. So that's a pretty rough beginning and i talk that's about about as rough as it gets <laughs> I, I don't think you could have started much rougher than that and i'm glad i did it because now i've heard from many readers that the number of young people who've been psychologically abused mm -hmm. and they can relate to this and i can show how i got through it and how by god's grace and some very special people that you read about and a special yeah. dog a little dachshund dog or pet it was such a source of joy. Mm -hmm. I swear she was, Sissy was a little angel in dog disguise. She kept us happy in the midst of this horrible, tragic family and other mm -hmm. characters. And most of all, God's grace to, I mean, we had every excuse as so many do who mm -hmm. go through abusive relationships of ending up on drugs, in prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the cemetery, my brother and sister and I had every excuse, but by God's grace, we got through it. Some special people. I have a section on my Nana, my my paternal yeah. grandmother. Yeah, she was amazing. Really saved our lives. I mean, she, yeah. the most mm -hmm. loving, the most kind, the most generous, the most intelligent, the most funny person. <laughs> that just probably without her, I hate to think what would have happened to us. Well, it just goes to show God knows what you're going through and does provide the help. Even though you're still going through it, you're still going to enjoy I hope, it. You know, people take uh, comfort from that who are going through yeah. so many young people going through. Uh, well, I think narcissism is, is a pandemic. I'll be honest. It I is think a pandemic. It is a pandemic. And I have a friend, yeah. a dear colleague who teaches criminal justice. Mm. And he has a section. He had a lecture on pathological criminals yeah and he said every time i lectured half the girls in class got up and ran out of the room crying because oh, they were dealing with someone probably dating because they someone. had a boyfriend who was like yeah. that totally selfish control manipulative and you know if you wrote about narcissism they can oh, use yeah. everything they can use flattery they're they brainwash you they yeah. can use everything to control it's all about control yeah control everything. and isolation until and then they'll drive you to things like suicide uh to lose your mother it's just i can't even hardly uh my heart well, the other breaks. side of my faith was uh i believe she's a sweet dear christian woman i will see her in heaven yeah she'll mm. be fine and healthy and happy mm -hmm. and you know, we'll be together for eternity. Yeah. And it'll be all better. It'll be mm -hmm. worth it. It'll all be mm -hmm. worth it. Well, um, the, the great thing about your book is, is it really gets, it gets good. <laughs> That's not the most, uh, 
<laughs> eloquent way to say it, but it does. So it's going to get a lot better than that. So those that are watching, stick with us. That's the that's the beginning, but there's there's so much good in your life. All right, so let me jump to the next little excerpt um, that I found. This is just fascinating to me here. Many of my former students who knew me as a leading Jeffersonian and Burkean conservative will be surprised to hear this, but I abandoned my law school plans and prepared for graduate school to get a PhD in political theory and become a Marxist professor. <laughs> the, <laughs> the mistake I made was to get an excellent education <laughs> at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. There were seven theorists on the political science faculty where most departments had one or two representing every period, ancient Greece and Rome, Middle Ages, Renaissance, modern 20th century, liberalism, conservatism, communitarian, libertarian, etc. I soon learned there was a lot more to political theory than Marx, Lenin, and Mao. <laughs> the sublime and brilliant ideas of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Cicero, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, Machiavelli, Hannah Arendt, and Rawls wean me away from new left radicalism. I'm so glad. I've been an advocate of that. I'm so glad for me. <laughs> I've been an advocate of comprehensive, balanced, critical debate and academic freedom ever since. And my first textbook, The History of Political Theory, Ancient Greece to Modern American, embodies that comprehensive approach, which sadly they no longer have, of studying every idea from every perspective, confident the truth will emerge from a lively, free education. I love that paragraph, well, those paragraphs in your book, just to see you go from the, just that kind of uh, Marxism is just amazing that it continues to be of, of interest to, to so many. <laughs> I love your, your answer. Well, my, the, the mistake I made was I got a fine education. So anyway, right. I'd love to hear more about all of that. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, I was brought up in a conservative family, Republican family in Wisconsin. And, and uh, then I go to college, but I went to college in the 70s, which was sort of the late 60s. Uh, mm. And because of the Vietnam War, which nobody understood, it radicalized that generation. So we were all radicalized by the Vietnam War. And there was a dynamic, I describe a dynamic mm. Marxist professor and Yes. Hyp hypnotic practically so we all became communists and for the revolution and socialism and communism and <laughs> again the irony of god's humor no i go i drop going to law school and go to graduate school to become a marxist political theory professor <laughs> and the mistake i make is i go to the best political theory university graduate school in america rutgers <laughs> university Mm -hmm. that had seven political theory professors on the faculty, as you okay. said, representing ancient political theory, Plato, Aristotle, medieval, Christian, St. Augustine, oh, Aquinas. I imagine how much you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, and, oh. and seven political theory professors, and they debated and discussed, you know, every angle, and they welcomed criticism and challenging. So it was oh. the about the only political so nobody was getting offended if you didn't agree with them <laughs> right. at that time. Get, I had professors <laughs> who asked for criticism. Mm -hmm. They invited tell me where I'm wrong. Wow. Um yeah. and so I, I about the only political things I've gotten involved in is academic freedom. Mm -hmm. Academic freedom and censorship and political correctness and verbal harassment and all this came in around the year 2014. Yeah. It destroyed that academic university environment in America mm -hmm. and it turned it into indoctrination. Yeah. You believe this, you, you literally couldn't teach certain subjects. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't think certain things. You couldn't use certain words. Well, you know, you can't learn if you don't hear all sides. Yeah, I agree. Really, the Jeffersonian ideal of uh, 
the University of Virginia, where I taught, he, he said, uh, Jefferson said, here, we are not afraid to follow the truth wherever it may lead, nor are we afraid to tolerate any error mm -hmm. so long as reason is left free to combat it. One sentence description of academic freedom and the university. Um, you learn how to think. You see, when you hear all sides, you not right. only learn a lot of views, you learn how to think, how to yeah. reason. So when and new problems... That should come, not be missing from a university. Exactly. But, and yeah, really, I, the only reason America is the world leader isn't that we're necessarily better or smarter, but we have that freedom. Mm -hmm. And that leads not just intellectual progress, but economic progress, yeah. technological progress, political progress, I would say ethical progress. And so that freedom mm -hmm. is what causes us to be more advanced than any other country. Yeah, that's so important. And you do talk quite a bit throughout the book because you spent so many years, 40 years as a professor and watched this happen. So I do have some excerpts in here where you kind of go into that. I don't know if that's coming up next, but I know it is. Let me jump to uh, another page. Um, all right. This we're still. I, I've got quite a bit in here from your your academic years because I'm just so fascinated. <laughs> so we're going to spend some time there. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, <clears throat> it says those years in graduate school at Rutgers in the late 1970s, early 1980s were golden, demanding, hard, frustrating, scary, fun, exciting, and exhilarating. As I wrote upon retiring, what made America academia great and how it was destroyed, American Greatness, June 2019, later published as The Decline and Fall of the University. That was a bygone era of academic freedom, debate, and argument. Learn to think, analyze, create that 20 years later was sacrificed on the altar of political correctness, censorship, speech codes, Title IX, inclusion, diversity, equity, identity, politics, and mediocrity. So that really is kind of what you were just talking about. And that's that's a, a paragraph from your book that I think is a really strong indictment of the, the changes that you saw coming while you were there. The, it's tragic. I mentioned other mm -hmm wonderful institutions that I saw go down. And it's heartbreaking to see once vital mm. colleges, churches, ministries, foundations mm -hmm. be destroyed by usually poor leadership. Yeah. And mm. it's just heartbreaking. But then they often get revived again. I, I think the universities may come back. So there's, there's hope. Yeah. I think we're seeing some uh, I think we're seeing people more and more start to recognize where we've gone too far one direction and, you know, we start to move back. But um, so here's a little bit more uh, jumping ahead a few pages. <laughs> this affected the college in the summer of 2014 when the Obama Department of Education expanded the Title IX law on discrimination to include every aspect of academic and social life. Professor Laura Kipnis's book, Unwanted Advances, is the best summary of the efforts of these regulations that were overturned in 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turning open, free, lively, and pleasant universities into police states and the horrors of surveillance, interrogation, and arbitrary judgments and punishments. Ugh, that is, that just sounds like Nazi Germany, you know. It does. You yeah, the disadvantage like of, of teaching political theories. I've studied Nazi Germany. Yeah. I've studied Nazi Gestapo tactics. And they were there. They yeah. were there in American universe. Surveillance. Yeah, surveillance. Encouraging yeah. people to report mm -hmm. on others anonymously. Yeah. I mean, this is Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And it creates an atmosphere of fear and suspicion and mistrust and it's like a, a police state yeah and you you actually you go on to write about how you almost got um persecuted in that regard um interesting an atmosphere of fear and persecution prevailed by 2016 this had even affected 
University of Virginia Wise, that's the campus where you were teaching, where students and faculty were afraid to speak, act, or laugh for fear of being accused of offending someone and investigated, adjudicated, and expelled or dismissed by the Office of Conduct and Compliance. I composed a resolution on academic freedom for the Faculty Senate, <clears throat> which passed unanimously to little effect. I was never personally charged or investigated, as far as I know, but I knew faculty and students who were. It poisoned the whole atmosphere. By 2016, three years before I formally retired, I had in effect retired, only giving lectures and perfunctory office hours and then going home. The academic and social life of the college was dead. So you it sounds like you 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 spoke out and didn't get no, to, I, um I, I think one it. of the reasons I wasn't persecuted um because <clears throat> I'm sure I offended people. Um mm -hmm. that was my job. But mm -hmm. um yeah I taught constitutional law as well yeah. as political theory, and I knew they were violating the Bill of Rights, the mm. freedom of, of speech, due process of law that you have a right, if you're accused of a crime in the constitution, you have a right to know the accusation. They wouldn't tell you what the accusation was. Well, they weren't really defined. It was just what somebody thought. Mm. You have a right to know the accuser. They kept the accuser secret. Yeah. How do you defend yourself when you don't know the accusation or the accuser or the evidence? This is just so unconstitutional. And that's where there was a group of us. Uh, there was a Harvard Law professor. There was Laura Kipnis at Northwestern. There was a group of us, an organization called FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, that really fought this uh, at the government level and social level and intellectual level. And Laura Kipnis mm. was the best. She taught theater at Northwestern University. She's <laughs> a liberal feminist. Besides so being so smart, she's incredibly funny. And <laughs> she said uh, she got accused or got called into some accusation. And she said, wait a minute. This is America. I have rights. I don't know what they are, but I know how I have rights. Yeah. <laughs> and she blew the lid off. Do you know one of the worst things? This is really Nazi. Wow. After they interrogated you, they'd say, don't tell anyone what we did to you <laughs> wow yeah or wow. we'll punish you more uh -huh. and laura kipnis god bless her heart hmm. said oh i'm going to tell lots of people what you did to me. <laughs> she walked out of the meeting went across the campus went to her office wrote an article for the chronicle of higher education called my title nine inquisition Ooh, i like that and it <laughs> blew the lid off. And afterwards, she said wow. she got emails from hundreds of professors who had been intimidated into silence. Yeah. And they needed to see her stand up. I'm and glad we're talking did, about her. She deserves to be she, yeah, She's written a lot of books on theater and feminism. And she's hilariously funny and wow. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I told her one time, I said, Laura, <laughs> uh, you are the Joan of Arc of higher education. Yeah. And she said. Because yeah. she, she knew said, she might be going out there and getting torched for it. Well, that's what she said. She said. Did it anyway. <laughs> didn't they torch her? <laughs> yeah. I said, yes, Laura, oh but she God. died for France. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. she's She was willing to die for our country, essentially. Yeah. Well, let's jump over to some positive. I got something funny here to share. Um, so you, I will share that you you have your book divided, really interesting, kind of wrote about topics, your childhood. And um, so you have one section where you talk about your travels, which of course you went on a lot of travels as a professor. And so this is um, your travel to Oxford, it's where this comes from. <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> All right, it says, I will never forget the opening tea and reception in the hall of Trinity College. I was admiring a teacup and saucer with the college crest on it and remarked, this is nice. I'd like to steal one. <laughs> At that moment, 
someone nudged me and said, I'd like to introduce you to David Eastwood, senior tutor at Pembroke College, who will be leading the English side of the symposium. A man about my age shook my hand. Oh dear, I said, an official of Oxford University? And I'm talking about stealing cups. <laughs> he smiled and replied, ah, but not an official of Trinity College. <laughs> Is that hilarious? I mean, that should we be became on stage. fast friends, similar in attitude and scholarly interests in the 18th century British and American political thought. We also both enjoyed a good joke. He asked me, are we to have the Sheldonian Jefferson at the conference? I replied, Sheldonian? Or no, that's down the street from here referring to the Sheldonian Theater or University Auditorium on Broad Street, built by my ancestor, Gilbert Sheldon, Restoration Archbishop of Canterbury after being Chancellor of Oxford and Master of Trinity College. When they found that I was related to a prominent member of the college, they showed me an oil portrait of him in which they claimed to see a family resemblance, which evaded me, and thought he was more ruddy, whatever that means. <laughs> Sorry, that's kind of long, but it's so good. I, I just had to get it all in. What a you scene. Got, you, you got one of the funniest scenes in the book. Um, and there's and a this, lot of funny ones, but that this was... Could be, this could be on, on the stage. That yeah. scene, <laughs> and as you know, there are lots of funny scenes throughout the book, and I try to emphasize, they're funny things. The great thing about humor, and I love I love comedy shows and musicals and so on, because they, they cheer you up. You know, they take this ridiculous world and you get a laugh and you mm -hmm. see the funny side of life. Yeah, I, we've got to do that because life can be really hard, but it can also be funny at the same time. And boy, you pulled that out. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we have to learn to laugh at ourselves. That's the problem True. with it. We're That's, so serious and so that is so that important for, for mental health too, which is you've got to topic. learn to not take yourself so seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so the next part is just really impressive to me. This is when you're in Istanbul, Turkey. You say, In Turkey, I spoke with several governmental, academic, and business representatives. Almost all boast of their founder, Ataturk, and his reforms in politics, religion, education, and economics. His emphasis on democracy, freedom, and independence increasingly reminded me of my hero, Thomas Jefferson, and I mentioned this to a few. When I returned home, Brent told me the government of Turkey would support my writing of a book comparing Jefferson and Ataturk. This was completed a few years later as Jefferson and Ataturk Political Philosophies. But this required another trip to Turkey for research on Ataturk involving interviews with governmental, judicial, military, academic, business, and religious leaders. Things have changed dramatically in that country since then, but I had some extraordinary experiences in Turkey in the 1990s. Ah, now that sounds like a fascinating book. Yes, as <laughs> you, know, you um, to know to write it is... Yeah, Istanbul, Turkey, was the center of the um, Ottoman Empire, mm. the Muslim Empire in the Middle Ages that ruled all of Eastern Europe, the Middle East, mm. and after World War I, like the Russian Empire and the Austrian Empire, it was all broken up. It was all destroyed, and mm. the only thing left was the country of Turkey and the capital, Istanbul which is so historic because it was the capital of the Ottoman Empire for a thousand years, just like Vienna was the capital of the Habsburg Empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, Moscow was the center of the Russian Empire. And they were all broken up, but Ataturk, Kemal Ataturk rescued the center of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey. After World War I, he was a soldier and political leader and he preserved the heart of Turkey. And the more I heard about him, I mean, he was for freedom of religion, yeah. a republic, Amazing. free speech. 
And I'm going, you know, this sounds like Thomas Jefferson. You know, and my first book was The Political Philosophy of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, so you would be able to draw that comparison very expertly. So they're very keen then. It was a, it was mm. a secular, it was primarily Islamic, but it was a secular republic back then. It was already turning into a more fundamentalist Muslim country like the Middle East. And now it is. Mm -hmm. But back then it was, it was really more like a European country. Hmm. And they told me during the heart of the uh, Ottoman Empire, it was very sophisticated, very European. And there were actually people in the government who were Jewish or Christian. It was very wow. diverse. Wow. And uh, uh, fascinating, beautiful city, Istanbul, right on the Bosphorus <laughs> Channel. Oh. oh, and the architecture and the Blue Mosque. And it's just breathtaking. And, and I haven't been back, but, you know, it's changed almost totally just like russia yeah uh, it just russia, doesn't know what happens the soviet when, union when freedom is is taken away the changes right. are they're never positive so right yeah well let's jump over to moscow now <laughs> i have a little <laughs> excerpt from your time in moscow i had been invited to visit russia because a professor at moscow state university was translating my book the Political Philosophy of Thomas Jefferson, for publication in his country, with support from the United States Information Agency. I was told it was the first American book on Jefferson to be printed in the former USSR. I had a letter from Nikita P., who had been a leading Soviet scholar on Jefferson, to assist with the translation, and he could only communicate via the new email. <laughs> as regular mail and international phone calls were too expensive. Remember, this was before the internet. I was the first faculty member at the college to get a computer and email just to do this project. So I love that paragraph because it just kind of highlights so much that you had this, this book that would be translated for the USSR, former USSR, and you're using this brand new technology to do it. So I'd love you to talk a little more about that. That really dates me. You realize I was in my forties. <laughs> I was middle aged <laughs> when the technological cyber revolution happened. Yeah. And uh, my first book, The Political Philosophy of Thomas Jefferson, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, was my Rutgers doctoral dissertation. Ah. And it only took about 10 years and 100 rejection letters before it got published. Oh, wow. But oh, then wow. <laughs> it went around the world. That's yeah. how I got to Oxford. That's how I got to Moscow. Oh, interesting. That's how I got to Vienna, Austria. Was and that book? Istanbul, wow. That one book. And I heard from scholars in India, mm. in Eastern Europe, because all around the world, Jefferson is just so admired as the father of American democracy. Yeah. The philosopher of American democracy. What a great person to have studied carefully. Ugh. So I got all around the world from that book. And in Russia, communism had just ended. They were trying to figure out how could we have a republic? Interesting. And so they so turned to you in your book. Read, he, he was a scholar of the uh, uh, American political thought and, and mm -hmm. read that book and had it translated into Russian and published in Moscow. And that's what got me there for meeting the publisher and uh, giving a talk. Uh, and boy, Russia, what an experience. I, I just. Uh, wow. Yeah. What an experience to go there for one thing. But the reason that you were there is so profound. Really, well, I mean, it was the same with Vienna. I, I love Vienna, is such a beautiful city, the, yeah. the capital of the Austro Hungarian Empire. Yeah, and there was a professor at the University of Vienna who came across my book on Jefferson. Wow, and wrote to me and said, Would you come and speak? And then the chair of the department asked me to come teach a class at Vienna. Wow, so that one book led to all these different experiences. I am so amazed by that. And and that you just said it took 10 years to get it and all those rejection letters. The last question I'm going to ask you is what <laughs> advice you have for aspiring authors. But I feel like we need to just kind of put a little arrow right here for them and say, keep trying because you did Absolutely. have this incredibly important book that kept 100 rejections 
and then look <laughs> at how it transported you around the world itself, all around, around the, world. the world. So, so be so, persistent. Don't give up. Yeah. Um, if you believe this is a good work, if you believe this is a good yeah. book, don't worry about rejections. Um, I grew up with a nursery rhyme about the little engine that could, the little train yeah. that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Going up again and again and grew up with a Protestant work ethic. of don't, If you believe in something, don't be discouraged. Yeah. Don't be discouraged by rejection. If it seems right to you, you really believe in it, keep doing it. So, you know, after being rejected by a lot of minor publishers, it's accepted by Johns Hopkins University. Yeah, yeah. look at what you where you landed. One of the best presses in America. Wow. And then it was reviewed in England, the Times Literary Supplement, and you know, uh, William and Mary Quarterly. And so, if you believe in something, especially a book or an idea or a purpose, a work, don't let rejection defeat you. Yeah, you are an incredible example of that. Again, I love your memoir for, for all of that. Um, let's see, we're going to jump now. Um, like I could spend hours with you, <laughs> but I want to jump. Now, this this next part, I'm actually, I didn't really, I didn't want to end up reading it. I, I feel like I'd have to read the whole section. Um, so I just want you to talk about your Bardstown brothers, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> this is so interesting because uh, it's a group of friends who are ministers in my area, which is uh, Southwest Virginia, the mountains, uh, the Appalachian Mountains near Kentucky and Tennessee, which I find the most beautiful scenery on earth. I just fell in love with the mountains and the people are so friendly and it's like living in Mayberry. Um, and there's a group of ministers who took an annual retreat to a Catholic monastery, uh, the Abbey at Gethsemane in Bardstown, Kentucky. And these are all evangelical ministers. And they go and live at a, at a convent and the Sisters of Charity convent. And then we go to Compline and worship at the Abbey with the monks. And it's a real retreat because you're out of the world, just like being in a monastery. You're out of the world for about a week. You're away from traffic, away from business. And uh, I take long walks around the beautiful grounds of the convent and uh, the worshipful uh, services at the Abbey. And, and uh, so we wrote, uh, one of my friends, Greg Sergeant, a uh, local pastor, suggested uh, uh, writing a book of our experiences. And since I was raised Anglo-Catholic, I was raised in the Episcopal Church in Wisconsin when it was all high church, or they call it Anglo-Catholic, emphasis on liturgy, ritual. And so I wrote the chapter on ritual and liturgy. But others wrote chapters about what is the effect of um, the contemplative life on ministry, on visiting the sick, on praying. On the, so... Um, uh, it, it really is a great experience. I'm going next week to a retreat there. And I've been going 10 or 15 years every October. And it's just been a terrific blessing. It's also uh, the heart of whiskey country. It's rough for Baptist. Um, the heart of, they have more distilleries than any place else in the world. <laughs> oh, wow. For some reason, that part of Kentucky has a lot of distilleries. And uh, you can smell it when you're about 30 miles away from Bardstown. Oh, you can wow. you're smelling it. But uh, it also is a cute town, has wonderful shops. and uh, But the main thing is the uh, contemplative life. And the book was called Retreat of the Soul. Mm -hmm. the contemplative life. And it really is. Uh, is that on Amazon? Special. Yeah. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. find it. Okay. Well, Sounds like a fascinating group and a great book that you put together. Spiritual experience. We're all mm. very close friends. We're brothers. And yeah. bless them, the sisters at the convent, sisters of charity, um, put on a little welcome for us <laughs> because we've come so many years. We live in their guest house, a beautiful guest house. Uh, and they put up a sign, welcome back, 
Bardstown Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you guys over here on the, you're, you're famous around there. I love it. Love yeah, it. it's just yeah. a wonderful, again, many blessings in my life. I put in the memoir, unexpected, out of the blue. Why don't you join us at the retreat? And it becomes <laughs> this really valuable experience. Yeah, I think that's really neat to point out that we have hardships. I mean, you had a rough start and you had to watch academia decline like it did. But at the same time, you're, the experiences that come along, the opportunities that you just would never predict. I, I doubt you would have ever predicted that you'd finally get your dissertation published and it would just shoot you around the world and that you would have a brotherhood like that and you guys would write a book together. And I just love that about life. I think that's the thing we have to focus on. Um, but now with that said, the next topic that I want to talk to you about, I think it's really kind of fitting to follow up with all these wonderful things. Um, you do have a section in here that it's um, subtitled mental health. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just read a couple excerpts from that because mental health is such a problem for so many I think on some level, we all are struggling with mental health. And so to see someone of your stature and your experiences also suffer, uh, there's a lot to learn from that too. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to let you kind of expound on that more as well. So it says, in the early 1990s, I was diagnosed with major depression caused by very stressful situations in every aspect of my life family, work, church, community, profession, etc. It manifested itself in my not just being sad, but hypersomnia, sleeping all the time, panic attacks, and general exhaustion. Picking up a pencil seemed like an enormous effort. Okay, I'm going to jump down and read another little bit farther on, and then we're going to talk about it. Stress and the mental illness it causes is a great epidemic of our time. Yes. Constant pressure, demands, and interruptions all increase this stress and the psychological problems it causes. My experience is that getting away from this world of trouble is essential. Even Jesus took off to the mountains to be alone with God. The greatest stress reliever is my Christian faith and prayer. Contemplation, worship, sacred music, study, and devotion Take me away from life's stresses and allow me to be both happy and productive, encouraging others. And I just appreciate this so much because I'm going to be honest. I feel like I'm going through something like that. I just, the fatigue, oh my word, I'm, at my age, I am so tired. And I've changed my eating. I've tried to sleep more. You know, I'll be honest, I finally, I think I've come to the realization that I have so much stress buried, you know, with the, our heads spin and we, we feel anxious all the time. We're in fight or flight mode all the time from the stresses of our modern world. And I am in the process right now of doing what you learned to do. And it's helping. I'm getting better. But I have had moments of just like constant fatigue, doesn't matter how much I sleep. Um, and, uh, I, I think it's such an important thing to address and I'm really grateful that you were so open, you know, about the hard things in your life to, to share with us all that you did have that deep mental, uh, that depression. Um, I'd love you to talk a little more about that. I feel like this is so valuable to learn from. Absolutely. And I, you know, I wrote this book, uh, four or five years ago mm. and, then it was it was nothing like it is today yeah the stress caused by millions of stimuli on your brain every day social mm -hmm. media marketing interruptions yeah. there, there are people young people now who work six jobs oh my gosh yeah and the four, economy four the jobs online versus what you make on site they're all working overtime and not getting overtime pay what happened to unions? Um, I have a mail carrier that says she works 12 hours a day, wow. mandatory overtime, and they don't wow. get paid overtime. What happened to the 40 hours? How is that legal? Oh, my so God. Think of it. And then you go home. We used to have a private, quiet life at home. Now you're bombarded with the Internet, social media, mm -hmm. and that's causing this epidemic of stress. 
the brain was not made to deal with that much. Yeah. And so what I had in the early 90s is nothing compared to what most people have today. And you see it on the road. Crazy drivers, accidents, insurance is saying accidents are epidemic because people are going crazy. Uh, relationships are going crazy. Online, oi, online. Narcissists are everywhere. <laughs> online, so-called relationships, AI. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, knowledge of the world problems. You get so to hear about sustained. every problem everywhere. Yeah. Children <laughs> on the cell phone. Um, mm. But it's the same thing that overstress breaks down, you know, physical, physiologically breaks down your sensors in the brain. Mm -hmm. And you either get, I had hypersomnia, I slept all the time, or insomnia, and you never can get to sleep. Yeah. You worry all the time. Yeah. And so the prescription, I had a wonderful doctor who diagnosed it immediately, mm. put me on what then was an antidepressant that pulled me right out of it. Oh, that's and good. I didn't, I didn't want to stay on medication. So I figured out, by the grace of God, to get away. Yeah. When I start feeling the stress, it feels like a black cloud coming over my brain. Wow. That's, that's depression. And when I see it coming, I was blessed mm -hmm. to have two jobs, a church minister and a college professor with very flexible schedules. And I could just take off. And we need to take off. As I said, Jesus, during highs and lows, took off alone to the mountains to be alone with God. Yeah, We have to do that. We used to call that your prayer closet. It doesn't have to be the mountains or the woods, but someplace where you can get away. And then the other thing is, of course, mm -hmm. probably because of my Irish background, humor, happiness. Yeah. I love <laughs> watching funny old TV shows. I have the DVDs of all the old comedies <laughs> and comedy <laughs> movies. Yeah, and you do music. talk about your, your favorite entertainment in here as well. So <laughs> it is a therapy, as mm. King Solomon said, laughter is a medicine. Yeah. Watching a funny show, the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> Andy Griffith show, um, Barney and laughing <laughs> and lighthearted. I tell you, it helps your sleep. It helps yeah. your mood. Again, my children probably thought they were married. They were they're fathered by a comedian because, you know, every evening I'm watching comedy shows. Yeah. But it's uh, as Barney Fife says, it's therapeutic. Um, <laughs> it yeah. really is important to enjoy, as Solomon said, eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah. Enjoy the simple pleasures of life, yeah. food, um, and I would companionship. Say and I would say, along with the simple pleasures, I, I, I'm finding that you do need to simplify. There's something about our environment, our technology. Everything is getting so complex and so high yeah. speed. that Every we need day it gets worse. They get your yeah. name or address and you're suddenly bombarded with a thousand new requests and marketing yeah. and you don't know half of them might be scams and yeah the stress of all that I had to kind of narrow down and say narrow okay down. these are the few things that that i'm going to focus on and get good at and, and right kind of, you have to let don't worry about all, all the stuff you full don't of have. opportunity because of it all but it, it's overwhelming there's too many choices i think sometimes and I also got into a healthy diet, exercise. Mm -hmm. I swim every other day, yeah. um, Epsom salt baths uh, yeah. for pain relief, sleep. You know, sleeplessness is epidemic in our country. Yeah. I was talking to a shrink, a psychologist, who said that he, acknowledged, he thought 80% of mental illness was due to sleep deprivation. Interesting. Ooh, 80%. So how do you sleep yeah. if you're worried all the time and bombarded? And you're scrolling with as you're going to bed with these screens and lighting you up. Messages and social media and games and all. Yeah. I begin winding down to sleep at about six in the evening. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big dinner. I have high tea and my big meals in the middle of the day. And yeah. I shut off the computer, the phone, the television, except for comedies. <laughs> um, and begin winding down, begin winding down. Yeah. 
Yeah. I read something light, uh, like my favorite cartoonist, Charles Schultz, Peanuts cartoons, <laughs> Snoopy, Love it. which is also a philosopher. But hmm. I mean, something light and <laughs> funny and happy. And uh, by nine o'clock, I'm ready to turn out the light and sleep. Yeah. Good sleep cycles, so essential to health, especially mental health. Wake up, I now am retired and 70 years old, so I sleep between 9 and 11 hours a night. I get about 9. <laughs> and wake up and feel great. It's okay. You don't have to feel guilty about sleeping more. Well, right. that, that transitions to really the last topic that I have. Um, there's so many things in your book and you've got topics about family and, and health. Like you touched on, you even share your favorite breakfast food, which I love. I'm going to try. It. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the last topic is really what you just taught, what you just mentioned. And that is retirement and kind of like with the, the brothers, I just am going to ask you to talk about uh, what you have to share about retirement. I don't, I'm not really going to read an excerpt, but I just kind of wanted you to give your wisdom and your experience on that. Well, I'm so blessed to be able to retire. You know, I would say in future, future generations, there may not be social security and a pension and you can retire and not work if you choose not to, or I, I have work, but it's all projects, you know, books and various projects I'm working on, but I have, my own schedule, but I retired from the college at 65 because the university had, was no longer a college. I mean, it was no longer academia. So I was ready to retire and I retired from the church ministry. I was a professor for about 40 years and a minister for about 25 years. So I retired from the church uh, in June and it's just amazing. I told my brother, who I talk to every week, who's a retired uh, naval officer, and he agreed. It, it's like a whole new life um, to not have that constant pressure, responsibility, I, ha people, hassles, problems. Not that we don't have challenges, but to be able to arrange your schedule. Because as you get older, you have to slow down. I mean, you don't have the energy you used to have. Um, and so you do have to take care of yourself. I live in the country. I enjoy taking long walks. Um, every stray dog in the county ends up on our farm and my kids adopted them. Um, so animals, by the way, animals are a great comfort. Pets, dogs and cats. I have a beautiful orange tabby cat around here somewhere who's the most <laughs> affectionate creature I've ever known. I think you sent me a picture. I'll be sure to put that up. Put that right picture now. up of Milton. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I remember my great grandfather, Charles Sheldon, who wrote In His Steps, famous Christian novel, said that he thought we have a right to repose. Repose means rest. When you retire in your 70s, whatever, you have a right to repose. And in this crazy world of ours, the world saying, oh, no, you don't. You've got to do this and this and this. You're not doing anything. Go over here. Start this job. Do this. Do that. And I spend a lot of time saying, no, thank you. Yeah. Because pretty soon there won't be retirement. And we need that. We need that rest, yeah. reflection. Yes. I was yeah. telling a friend of mine, one of the Bardstown brothers, it's like instead of having all the stimuli bombarding your brain, job, people, problems, your brain is able to go out. You're able to think yeah. and project. And you honestly, I've noticed just four months of full retirement, I see things differently. Wow. Yeah. I think differently. And you're getting near the end of your life. So you contemplate what that means you look back on your life you contemplate when you're mm -hmm. no longer here and that's what you should do in old age <laughs> well you're not too old yet but you're old enough to disperse some excellent wisdom on that topic and um so i'd like to to move to my last question we kind of already talked about this um as you were discussing getting your book published, but 
Do you have any additional advice for aspiring authors? Yes. Um, and it might be a bit antiquated too, because like everything else, publishing has really changed. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, indeed. Really indeed. changed. It used yeah. to be there are some key publishers. Um, now there's a lot of self You picked up too bad for you. So. Well, there's self-publishing. There's uh, mm -hmm. publishing on Amazon. There's all kinds of different things, but it really has changed. But what hasn't changed is the motivation. If, if you feel like my memoir or my book on Jefferson, you have something to share of value. Find the time to do it. Go to your writing closet. Find your time to do it and pray and ask God his will for having it published, disseminated, spoke on. And don't get discouraged. Uh, as I told you, my famous book on Thomas Jefferson, the political philosophy that got me all around the world, <laughs> took 10 years to get published. Probably 100 <laughs> rejection letters. That, that is, honestly, that is really an incredible um, evidence of your persistence. I think 10 years and 100 rejections most people would probably quit about five years and 50 rejections and feel like they gave it a good shot. You know what I mean? No, no <laughs> if, you, if you believe in it, don't give up. Yeah. Um, and that book came out of my experience at Rutgers of looking at all the political philosophies and their effect on Jefferson and the founding of our country. Yeah. And uh, forgive my pride. I knew it was good. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's okay. You can know that you wrote good. something good. You you knew the inspiration you felt when you were it's writing important. it. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to give up. I'll just keep sending it out. I also believe in God's timing. Mm, yeah. That's it a may point. be delayed for a reason. And later on, you find out why it had to come out at that time. Yeah, that's a good point, too. It may come out instantly. But uh, mm. if you believe in it or any other cause or belief uh don't let the world discourage you yeah and i think too along those lines sometimes we need to be able to not judge the outcome so critically if you put out a book and it doesn't sell a thousand copies or let alone go around the world it doesn't mean it wasn't worth writing or it's not valuable so often we use the world's measuring sticks to determine if we've been successful or not. And we all do. It's easy to do. If your book reached somebody and it changed someone's life, which I believe any anyone's important book is going to help somebody, the value of that one person needs to needs to matter, needs to matter to us. So. Absolutely. It's just like yeah. I've often said at uh, funeral uh, eulogies, um, of, of very obscure, humble people, older yeah. women who were not rich or famous and so on. Mm -hmm. And yet there will be dozens of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren get up. I've had funerals go on for hours with family testimonies of mm -hmm. how this one humble woman changed their lives. Yeah. We tend to say, well, I'm just one person. I can't really affect the world. Yes, you can. Yes. Especially with children, especially yeah. with your art or your writing. And as your you story. Just said, what if it gets to somebody, yeah. as my book did, in India? Yeah. Or Russia. And what if it takes 50 years or 100 years from your right. passing? Right. And, and it, it, who's to say it won't one day be a cherished book by a whole nation? You just don't right. know. But you there's know. no chance it'll happen if you don't write it and publish it and preserve so it. So all you can do, as I found in St. Augustine's mm -hmm. Confessions, mm. is if you feel this prompting to do this, that may be the Holy Spirit of God. That may be the will of God saying, I want you to do this. Yeah. And you do it and leave the consequences to him. Exactly. Don't worry about the world's response or criticism. Exactly. Um, in fact, uh, sometimes attacks and criticism are a good sign. Yeah, that is that is true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, great discussion. I loved all of it. I, I could go for another hour, but I'm going to just 
thank you so much for, for joining me. And maybe we can have you back and talk about some of your other books. I like to thank just you. do one book at a time. So I would love to. It's a wonderful that. format. You ask the questions in a way that <laughs> stimulate my thought. Thank you. Well, coming from a professor of your stature, that means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will definitely be having you back. And oh, you did mention to me in the email as we were preparing for this that you are updating one of your books um, after 30 years. Is that right? What would Jesus do? Um, yeah. The novel, What Would Jesus Do?, which was published in the 90s and mm -hmm. was a big movement with WWJD bracelets and youth oh, yeah. revivals and went all over the world. The book was yeah. translated into French and Spanish and German. And That's a big deal. You, you kicked just, off that. You know, that's a <laughs> the acronym, you know. <laughs> My great grandfather's book, In His Steps, yeah. written 130 years ago, launched oh. that question of Christians saying, what would Jesus do in my place? Yeah. And how their lives are changed. And so I noticed that it had been 30 years since it was published. And a lot has changed in 30 years. <laughs> so I really yeah. felt inspired to update it. I hope it'll be out in a few months. I hope you'll well, interview me on it. That's why I brought this up. Let me know when it's been republished. I'm going to get a copy. I'm going to read it. And we're going to come back. And take a deep dive into that book. And I think that'll Fantastic, be Fantastic, because I really think it is for this time. Yeah. The the problems 30 years ago and 130 years ago were all social, political, economic. The problems now, as we just discussed, are emotional, mm -hmm. spiritual, moral. So that question launches yeah. a whole different response yeah. than a book even 30 years ago. I agree. I agree. I'm glad to... I'm glad to know that you feel inspired to to come back around and and, and uh, address the problems that we're having today and how that question helps us in our modern day, more modern day. I guess it was modern day still when you wrote it, but, um, you know, even more advanced um, in our technology and in our problems. So Right, right. Uh, and you see the response, these youth revivals all around the world, high school yeah. students yes. coming to Christ and seeing yeah. the answers because the problems are different but yeah. god is the same god is always the same the bible says jesus is the same yesterday today and forever so the answers are in mm -hmm. god's word mm. they're different problems but the answers are the same i think you should i think you should adjust the title so that everybody knows this book from the first one well the title is going to be what would Jesus do now? Oh my gosh. I wish I had said it first. I was just going to say, it should be, what should Jesus do now? And you, well, that's well, what I was thinking. Yeah. Great minds, great minds, right? Uh, well, when God tells you, I should have said it first. It <laughs> <been evident. laughs> yep. What would Jesus, yes. do, what would Jesus now? do now? And it that's begins just with what I was thinking. problems we talked about. That way we know this is the book for, for our current time. And, and we know about your, your, your one. Addiction, it, uh, it deals with addiction of all kinds, not just drugs, uh, yeah. addiction to media, addiction to yeah. social media, addiction to all kinds of things, uh, the epidemic of our time, mental illness, all that we talked about. And yeah. uh, God has answers to all this. I look forward to that book. I can't wait. So I will get you get a copy <laughs> as soon as it's published. I will Quit get being retired and get to work. <laughs> You're retired. Get to work. Where are you? It's in the works. Yeah, it should I'm be out in a couple months. I'll get you a copy as soon as it's published. I would love that. And appreciate you interviewing me on it. Absolutely. Well, I will look forward to that and hopefully it will just be a few months from now. <laughs> if you're a reader that enjoys nonfiction books and would like to help out new authors, go to my website, triumphpress.com, and you can sign up to be an ARC reader. ARC is an acronym for Advanced Reader Copy. And that means that you would get a copy of a book before it's released to read it and be prepared to leave them a review when it's published. If that sounds like something you'd like to do, be sure to go to my website and join my Triumph ARC Reader team. If you got something out of this show, please give it a thumbs up because it really helps us to reach more people. And if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel because I'd love to have you in my community.